Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Tima Abbas Daly, and joining me to review all the action from Budapest is Inside F2's Fraser Ford. How the heck are you, mate? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Looking forward, as always, to talking about uh, all things Formula 2, Formula 3. It's uh, one of my favourite things to do. It's, if only you had a podcast where you did that by yourself the rest of the time, you know? it's it's. I feel like you're missing something there. Tell me about it. Maybe I should think about that, you know? Inside F3, I'm telling you. <laughs> Amazing. Imagine. We'll jump right into what the hell has happened, though. And uh, PHM Racing by Shrews have... But another driver change this time. They've replaced Mackenzie Creswell with Wu Hyun Shin for the rest of the 2023 season. Shin has been competing in GB3, where his best finished season was P4 at Park, and he's also raced in the Formula Regional Middle Eastern Championship earlier in the year, where he got a best result of second place in the penultimate round in Abu Dhabi. Always kind of happy to see new drivers come in and out. It was interesting to see... Fraser will come in and then leave again. And we've had that with a couple of drivers now where we're not sure how long they're necessarily staying for. And it's also really weird because there's not much of their three season left either. So it's kind of, I keep thinking because F2 and F3, oh yeah, up until Abu Dhabi. I'm like, oh no, no, actually it's just the next couple of things in Monza, then we're done. But he didn't have the best opening weekend, it must be said, but I think all just good experience. Yeah, definitely good experience. And you know, listen, if if uh, he's looking for a seat next year, then I think this is an amazing way of getting up to speed nice and quickly before before the end of the season. He didn't wasn't necessarily having the best season in GB3. Um, I think that's fair to say. So um, you know, why concentrate on a GB3 season? I'm, I'm saving a GB3 season um, when uh, yeah, you can get a bit of a bit of experience in a Formula Three car if that's what he's going to be doing next season. So risk um, yeah, versus reward is, is worth it there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I've been speaking to to Brad Benavidez recently. I spoke to him uh, in, in an interview, and he was essentially saying that um, you know, for a lot of drivers, they would rather take the risk of stepping up to a new category and uh, learning quicker. You learn an awful lot more by jumping up to a new category and you know throwing yourself in at the deep end. You learn a lot more by doing that than you do by having another season at the same level and trying to take yourself to the next level. So I think for for, for Shin, I think it makes sense for him to jump up to Formula 3 if that's what he's looking to do next season and to kind of uh, learn over the next two rounds and, uh, yeah, go from there. So, uh, yeah, good for him. Formula 3-wise, pole position was claimed by Zach O'Sullivan. Nice, strong pole from him. And in over in F2, who's uh, someone to help me on this podcast just to butter a point home that we've been having a bit of discussion about off, off the podcast there. Jack doing with pole position there. I know which one of those is my favourite, but both very strong pole positions. Both really strong pole positions. Jack Doohan, actually. Let's talk about him because um, he actually he hasn't qualified outside the top five in Formula 2 since Baku, which is, uh, yeah, crazy, crazy effort. Really good consistency in terms of qualifying. This has been building and it? it's uh, a result that he had a he had a pretty shocking start to the season by his own admission in, um, in, in Bahrain. And he had a bit of a shocker in Melbourne at his home race as well. Not the best weekend in Baku. And uh, yeah, this has been coming. This has been building since since Baku. He's uh, since the mid-season test to be fair. Uh, really got on top of the the virtuosi and uh yeah he's uh everyone's talking about uh daniel ricardo being uh, back in formula one this uh this weekend but yeah we, we've got another uh, another aussie um uh, who's uh back back and back for good i think i think uh, jack doing will be uh competitive for the rest of the season yeah he's hoping because it's uh again it's, it's championship isn't done and dusted by any stretch of imagination but the gap's widening so if he can just even bridge that gap to P4, P3 a bit further before season's end. And Abu Dhabi, we always know there's some craziness there in terms of new drivers coming in just for one-off and that just having a turning thing completely on the head. If something happens there to top, title, top two title contenders, Iwasa and Duan there maybe, along with, I think, is it Behrman, I think, in P4, then there's a lot of interesting stuff that could could play out there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, his, his biggest issue is how consistent Fred Vesti and Theo Porsche are at the yeah. moment. You know, if uh, if it was a season like the last couple of seasons where there, has, you know, it's been a bit up and down. And uh, I know, obviously, Felipe Dragovic was incredibly consistent last season, but he was the only driver who was incredibly consistent. Mm-hmm. It was always drivers having bad weekends. And if it was a season like that, you'd still back him. You'd say, OK, he's not fully out the size of the race. But bearing in mind, you know, how consistent Fred Vesti and... Um, uh, and Tyre Porsche have been. I think it maybe works against him in that sense. But listen, if he can finish in the top four, maybe the top three outside chances, 32 points uh, behind Yuma Wasser, if he can finish in the top three, bearing in mind the start of the season he had, I think he'll take that. I think he'll take that. 
No, definitely would do indeed and sets him up nicely then potentially for next season. But that is what we also said last year. So we won't look at that too hard. We'll look instead at the F2 sprint race and Kushmini was on reverse pole there. And just a few talking points from the race, which we can delve into a little bit now. Novelak took Boshong out pretty early doors. Do we expect better from the Frenchman? Um, yeah, I think so. He's, he's, he's a good driver, isn't he? So I think we we maybe do expect better. Uh, was it a lapse in concentration, maybe, or just a, a frustrated move? I I, I don't know. Um, it didn't matter too much. They weren't in the points. So, um, yeah, maybe it's just uh, a little bit of frustration on Clement's side. Um, but, yeah, it was... Uh, that, that's pretty much been a season, fortunately, just frustration and out of the points. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 you know, I'm sure it's frustrating for for Ralph Boschong as well, who hasn't been in the mm. points since uh, I think you can say Jeddah, race winner in Bahrain, and it's just gone downhill since then, and it's just very unfortunate there because you're like maybe this yeah. is finally his year, and then we shouldn't have said that. We really shouldn't have said that. Exactly that. Exactly that. You know, as you said, he he, he led the championship, which seems crazy. He led the championship for the first two, three rounds of the season. And anything can happen uh, in Formula so. Two. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I feel for Ralph. Um, I, I think it probably is going to be his last season in Formula Two. Uh, so I, I do feel for him that he's he's going out and uh, not having the best of seasons. But uh, that is. I feel like Formula we do two. say that a lot about Boshong though, and he just comes back as this this Monty Python Black Knight there of he doesn't know he's won, doesn't know when he's beaten, he just keeps turning back up there and just let's see what I can do. <laughs> yeah, true. Maybe he'll turn up in a primary on ART next season. Who knows? <laughs> Would that be a twist? It was a pretty tactical race for the majority of it, though, as sprints go, until the final 10, 10 laps or so. But there was absolutely no touching Dennis Hauger, who pretty much took P1 from the get-go and then just stayed there. Yeah, I, it was a good drive by Dennis Hauger. I'm sure he won't be delighted with it, and I'm sure he'd rather be taking the feature race the, rather than the, the the sprint race. I think, you know, if you'd have um, said at the start of the season that he'd be celebrating a sprint race victory over a feature race and he'd be P7 in the stands, I think it is. I don't think he'd be overly happy with that but um yeah no it's, it's it, yeah it was good it was a good drive wasn't it it was a really good drive you can't fault that um and Dennis Hauger has actually been reasonably consistent this year he's one of five drivers who have um uh scored points in every single round bar one uh the other well three of those being Vesti, Porsche and Awasa the top three uh and the other so one glad being... you didn't test me there <laughs> <laughs> no the other one being Richard Bajor as well so Dennis Hauger is, he has been consistent. He just hasn't necessarily been consistently fast or you know, within the top few places of qualifying in particular. Again, it's, it's those uh, other drivers like Iwasa and Vesti and Porcher being consistent as well and higher up that get in his way. 100%. I, I think Dennis Hauger's maybe a bit of a victim of it being, in my opinion, the, the best Formula 2 grid we've seen since 2018 when you had George Russell, Orlando Norris, Alex Albon, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I think Dennis Hauger is very much a victim of that. I think uh, any other season and maybe he would have been, you know, one of the one of those drivers competing for the championship. But yeah, we've just ended up in a season where there's so much talent, there's so much consistency uh, at the top of the standings that, um, yeah, he's, um, he's fallen behind a bit. But, you know, he'll be back he'll be back next season with uh with a bang i'm sure he was also one of these drivers kind of always there but kind of flying under the radar a bit p2 in the sprint race and we're just kind of we're not surprised by it but we're also just very much that office meme of geez what are you doing there and how did you get here but also it makes perfect sense it's this weird contradiction that always just it's just iwasa it's what he does 100%. He's very consistent, isn't he? Which is exactly what you need in junior categories. I wouldn't say he's electrically fast. I, you know, he's, he's, he's winning Melbourne. It's more methodical. Obviously. Yeah, he is methodical. That's a really good word of, a way of describing it, to be fair. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say he has the one lap pace of Jack Doohan or Victor Martins, for example. I wouldn't say he has the outright race pace like Teo Porsche, for example, who has been, again, on the podium most weekends this season. But he's he's just consistently there. As you say, P2 in, in, in the sprint race this weekend and P4 in the, in, the, in the feature race, he just always seems to be there or thereabouts, doesn't he? And uh, he's uh, he's the top Red Bull driver this season. And, you know, you can't you can't argue with that. And, uh, yeah, with a outside shot of winning the title. Um, yeah, outside shot of an Alfa Tauri seat potentially next year as well, just to make that headache for Red Bull even more annoying for them. So it's kind of, if he he doesn't need to win necessarily, but if he does, then crap, what do we do with him? All of a sudden we need to 
oh no, it's like we've not thought this through completely properly. So it's it's yeah. there's a lot of potential for fun there. A lot oh of no, another for... driver we have to shoot off to uh, Super Formula to do a season there just to just to bridge the I gap. I forgot about you. Liam Lawson. Oh dear, this is getting out of hand now. Oh, we're gonna have to get charts out again and figure this out. We'll just we'll focus on Lee Behrman E three because phenomenal late move on what can only be described as an unsuspecting poor chair. He was just, he wasn't expecting that, was he? Ollie Behrman's made a bit of a habit of this, hasn't he? His, uh, some of his moves. His Baku. move around... <laughs> yeah, his, Baku, definitely his move around the outside of Enzo Fittipaldi at Silverstone as well, which is yeah, unbelievable. And uh, he just... He's, he's he's amazing uh, in wheel-to-wheel combat, isn't he? Which is uh, something that we... We've grown to absolutely love with Oli Behrman and uh, yeah, what a talent. Um, hasn't necessarily put it all together throughout the weekend, which is maybe something that he'll go away, have a look at and, uh, and work on. Um, but um, assuming he yeah, comes still back, a rookie. Yeah, exactly that. Assuming he comes back next season, he's going to be a real force to be reckoned with, maybe even the favourite for the championship next season. So uh, yeah, what a, what a move, what a talent. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what he can do for the rest of the season. Rounding out the rest of the top 10, then we had Porcher in P4, Deruvula P5, Miney P6, which is still pretty decent despite his starting position of reverse pole. He just kind of ran out of tyres and there wasn't much he could do about that. Martins in P7, Hadjar P8, Vesti P9, and Duan in P10. Pretty much all the drivers, more or less, that you'd expect to be up there. Yeah, pretty much. I I felt for Kush. I really felt for Kush. You know, it was a, a golden opportunity for him to, to maybe take his first win. It didn't work out. Um, I think... Yeah, he, he's still got to be absolutely ecstatic with his It goes season. back to what you were saying at the start with Benavides. It's worth the risk to, to jump into a new category and learn fast because we all saw that promotion and we were like, what on earth are they doing? <laughs> that is an interesting call. And then we're like, well, we're just going to go and delete those episodes where we were talking some, some nonsense yeah. about him because we clearly have no idea what we're talking about. And the fact yeah. that we're expecting him to be on reverse pole and convert it in his rookie season in a campos, you'd think there'd be something wrong with us, but it weirdly makes sense as well. Hundred percent. I mean, what yeah, what season he's had? He's 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 really taken to the Formula Two cars from the second he jumped in. By the way, in the Abu Dhabi test at the end of last season, he has not looked out of place in the Formula Two car at all. It just seems to suit his driving style, doesn't it? And um, he, uh, yeah, as you say, you know, for us to be sat here and saying, "Oh, it's a bit of a shame he didn't win the race." Uh, Bernard Mind he was starting on pole. Says all you need to know about um, Kushmoni and his season. Um, and I, you know, he'll be he'll be around for the next couple of years, in my opinion. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him to to be in a virtual next season for example or a, a team that is uh, likely to talk uh, can compete to win races so um yeah i think uh, this is just a start for kushmani so uh, yeah really excited to see what he can do moving forward looking at the feature race then it was another bad day for novel like dnf pretty much straight out of the box and uh, i have written oh well never mind because there's not really much else we could say on that one that's essentially his season again as we're, we're saying there so we had more entertainment, though, from Crawford and Maloney down the back of the pack, and it was nice to see that elbows out aggressiveness, but my oh my, they did realise they weren't fighting for points, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it was certainly aggressive from Jack, wasn't it? He's uh, definitely got his elbows out. It's very perez for later on in the F1. It was like, I- I've seen this before. <laughs> Uh, exactly that exactly that it was uh, it was aggressive it was hard racing uh, the stewards didn't see anything wrong with it um, so I guess that tells you everything you need to know I don't think Zay Maloney was overly impressed with it especially as uh, you know fellow Red Bull juniors I'm sure they uh, will have a about that at some point, I'm sure. But um, yeah, listen, Jack, Jack's had a pro- quietly good season as well this season. A few podiums here and there, which I think he'll be happy with. He's looked the better driver than Isaac Hajar, who I think a lot of people were tipping mm. to, to maybe come in and uh, have a really good season. So um, yeah. So really, we, we, really... we skip ahead to Hajar a little bit there just to, to go on to that, because um, one of the things I'll go, go off my note in a second, but one of the things I was kind of surprised at until this until that bit of the feature race because i thought up to that point oh he's been fairly quiet maybe he's taken the time he's matured but we haven't heard him on the radio in ages moaning about something maybe he's turned a leaf and crawford besting him is is getting the better of him and then oh no no, never mind he's he's back on again and uh, he's annoyed that he actually has to race someone yes it's cordial and you might not be expecting it to be from him but the alternative strategy was working really well for Cordial and he was well within his rights to fight for him. So I'm not sure why Hadjar was complaining, to be honest. 
Yeah, I, I get the frustration now. I mean, Cordial almost has nothing to fight for, so I do understand the frustration from Isaac. He's also got nothing to lose. He has also got nothing to lose, and I guess if you're running dead last and you're having a bit of a boring race and it's for track position, then I guess it's just uh, it's you know it's your way of entertaining it and uh, and and maybe practicing that will to will combat. So. Uh, he did, Cordial didn't do anything wrong, absolutely not. I can understand Isaac's frustration, but I don't think Cordial did did anything wrong. Um, it didn't ultimately cost Isaac Hajar too much. Uh, no. So, uh, you know, I'm sure looking back at it at the end of the race, he uh, maybe had forgotten about that one quite quickly, uh, given the race that he, he ended up having. But, um, yeah, interesting one, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I think I think we'll expect, I think we should expect to see Isaac Hajar uh, running in the top 10 more regularly towards the end of the season. I think he's turned a the corner um, and I think uh, yeah he'll be setting himself up for, for another season in Formula 2 next season so uh, yeah that's uh, yeah maybe something to expect for the rest of the season I don't know about you but for me whilst there was more race to run the highlight of the race and of the weekend enough to for me in particular was Alex Brundle's quote on lap 14 about Jack about Jack Dewan's tyres as Alex Jakes would say an absolute corker again Brundle it's a bit like porridge. Doesn't look great, but it seems to be working when describing Jack Dewan's tyres. And where does he come up with these brilliant, brilliant descriptions? Yeah, unbelievable. Isn't it? It's uh, yeah. You know what? I absolutely love Alex Jakes and Alex Young Brundle uh, in the in the commentary box. It's I, just uh, meant to I, be, isn't it? It really is. It really is. The two of them, they get, you can tell they get on so well. They they work so well together. And uh, as I say, it's just meant to be. It's just one of those combinations that just works, isn't it? And uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, please, please, you know, keep it as that for years to come. You know, hopefully uh, Alex Jones. I want that for the F1. Yeah, I mean, amazing. Just sign us up, you know, uh, for for F1 TV or or, or, or whatever, you know, Channel Four, maybe I don't know. Um, but um, it's a combination that just works, isn't it? Which is which is amazing. So, and I like both of them individually as well. They're both great people, mm. aren't they? No, definitely, definitely. But uh, something that doesn't work quite as well is that awkward moment for poor chair where you come across your teammate and he's fighting you into turn four and runs you off the track just a bit and consequently helps your championship rival in this case Vesti and shuffles you then behind Hadja imagine that was a fun kind of meeting after the race yeah I'm not sure there'll be well Teo from Teo's perspective anyway I'm not sure he'll be uh giving Victor Martins a, a big hug after the race and saying well done on your podium mate I'm not sure he will it's a really interesting one we've just been talking about it and um, we've uh, we've been talking about it on on the F2 show as we reviewed the uh the the Budapest race weekend and it's there, there's two sides, there's two points to this, right? I, I think the first point is um, Victor Martins simply defended uh, and Teo Porsche went off track. Uh, whether or not Victor Martins should have defended that aggressively, I don't know. Maybe Teo Porsche was maybe a little bit too aggressive with his overtake. Uh, and I put a poll out on Twitter. I was wondering, I was interested to see what people thought of that. And uh, actually, uh, 52% of uh, the voters said that actually Teo Porsche was too aggressive in their opinion and Teo Porsche maybe should have waited a little bit which was a really interesting perspective because I guess my first uh, initial reaction to it was wow Victor Martins is, aggr- is defending aggressively there uh, but maybe they're right maybe Teo Porsche should have waited a little bit particularly given his um, you know in, in, in the, the context of the championship he had more to so lose. So he's got the ex- more experience level there he's got more to lose as well if it goes wrong and at the same time maybe with all the other drivers this weekend there was just something in the air that just yeah all, that extra bit aggressive for some reason 100 percent. and uh someone on twitter actually said that you know they're both too aggressive they're both really aggressive when they fight against each other which uh maybe is a fair point as well i'm thinking about to to monaco where they had a little uh a little clash as well but that's so that's one point of it who was more aggressive martin's porsche should they maybe have uh uh yeah uh should poor share maybe have uh retros- retrospectively given a, a left it a few more corners if you like the, the the other point to this is art i know we don't have team orders as such in formula two but but for art to pit victor martins on that exact lap knowing that that, that exact moment that they, he would cut victor martins would come out in between poor share and vesti his main rival for the championship I, I didn't really understand it. I was screaming at the, the screen saying, why didn't you pit Victor Martins two laps earlier 
or two laps later so that he doesn't come out exactly in the middle of that battle, right? If they pitted him two laps later, yes, he would have been further behind Porsche and Vesti, but it allows Porsche to attack Vesti, which helps him in terms of the, cha- the driver's championship. But also in terms of the team's championship, you know, Porsche dropped back. He, he, he obviously... Um, uh, lost a place to to Hazard with the marbles on his tyres, and then subsequently then lost a place to Owasa as well. And it he, he he lost points for the team as well. And you know we look at the team standards right now, and you know Premier and ART are dead level on points after ten rounds. And you know maybe if ART had pitted Martins a couple of laps later, they would have been picking up a few more points in the championship and leading the championship because I think Paul Cher maybe would have had a run at Vesti. Even if not, he wouldn't have lost any places, but Martins would have flown past him on the fresher tyres and then maybe flown past Vesti as well. So I didn't really get it from ART. I know we don't have team orders in Formula 2 and you can't have team orders because of the amount of money that each driver is paying for their seat. I, you know, I'm not saying that ART should have told Victor Martins to let him through. It's just a curious but... strategy call and a necessary headache. Yeah, I just didn't really understand it, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, you're pre- pretty much agreeing, unfortunately, there. To be honest, I can't really have any controversy with you on that one. It does seem a bit curious. There. Like you say, you want to play the team game. You've got the rookie versus the veteran, and you need you need to prioritise the veteran because they've got the chance to win the championship because their future is more up in the air than yours is. And at the same time, it was hard fair racing, so maybe there's nothing to complain about at the end of the day. We enjoyed it, nothing bad came of it, and maybe we just have been starved of drama a little bit in places that we want to create a bit more that where we need it. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Yeah, listen, I'm all here for teammate battles and for drivers uh, being aggressive, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's enjoyable, right? It's enjoyable. It's, oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. It was very much a ooh moment. It was, it was. And I do wonder whether at the end of the season, you know, if uh, if Vesti wins the championship by three points from Porsche, for example, will we look back at that moment and uh, will that be the moment that, um, you know, could have changed? It's, it's like a Baku 2021 for Lewis. If, if only you hadn't done this or if only we'd had a full race in Spa, this kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how that pans out. Definitely. But Dewan was the one who won the race with pole, with fastest lap, solidifying him once again in my good graces and should be in yours now and you should never have doubted him for a second, Fraser. Uh, Vesti P2, Martins P3, as mentioned, Iwasa then P4, Hadjar P5, Porcher having to settle for P6, Helga P7, not bad, but probably not where he wanted it, Fittipaldi in P8, Correa in P9, which is lovely to see, and Vashor in P10. Yeah, it was it was a good weekend. Well, a good weekend. Good feature race for VAR. I'm sure they're happy to have two drivers in the points as well. And uh, nice to see Jerome Correa, um, yeah, beating Richard Vashore. Richard Vashore's obviously been a bit of a star this season. P8 in the championship, uh, 76 points, I think he's on. So uh, really good to see JM uh, beating Richard Vashore uh, fair and square over a race distance. And uh, yeah, I'm sure VAR will be, uh, albeit very low in the points, I'm sure they'll be very happy to be two cars in the points. So. Well, that about wraps it up for F2. F3-wise, though, which is where the real meat gets on the bone, I think. For the sprint yeah. race, we had Gabriel Mini on reverse pole, which was great to see there. And then uh, we had a little bit of chaos at left, right, and centre, which is essentially just Formula 3, to be perfectly honest. Ido Cohen, Sebastian Montoya, and Nicolas Solov all DNF'd. There was a lap one incident for both of the uh, Solov and Cohen, I think, with the consequences. Possible suspension damage? Oh, that was for Montoya but they took their time before materialising definitively for him and bringing out a late safety car. Solov then was caught up in the safety car restart chaos that saw Marty spun around as well as others. And it was a shame because he was on for his best F3 result prior to this, but just not meant to be today. Yeah, not meant to be. It's uh, it's a shame, and there, as there's, there's so many stories in Formula Three up and down the grid where drivers are saying, "Oh, you know, it could have been today. Could have been my day. Today could have been my day." There's just so much chaos and carnage in Formula Three, and that that I think uh, probably after every single race, you've probably got the top twenty all thinking they could have been in the points uh, at some point. You know, so um, and, it, and it's yeah. not unrealistic for them to think that either. Which is no, you know, the best bit about that, and also the most frustrating bit about that. <laughs> A hundred percent. You wouldn't like to be a driver in Formula 3. And it's so difficult in that championship to stand out. And I think that's what makes uh, Bortoletto's uh, championship lead that much more yeah, impressive. I, um, I say it every week. I don't know how he's got that. We've been watching the races, but we just don't quite understand how he's managed to get such a lead out there. Just like, but you've not really done much. 
but you have. <laughs> but I don't understand it. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't say Bortoletto's pace has been absolutely electric by any means, but he, you know, he started the season strong, didn't he? Two feature race wins in the first two rounds that has set him up for the season, um, and uh, and since then he's just been consistent. He's been consistently in the points. He's been qualifying uh, in that you know mid pack between you know third and, and seventh every single uh, weekend, which then gives you a chance in both races. It gives you a chance in the feature race on the Sunday, but it also gives you a chance to win races on the, on the Saturday and. Uh, yeah, obviously, we saw that this weekend with two really strong finishes, or uh, well, points finishes. Uh, and again, that's all he needs to do at this point is just continue collecting those points. And uh, he's got such a big gap now um, that, you know, he can continue as long as he qualifies. Um, I don't know, maybe sixth for for for, for both Spa and Monza. Um I don't see how anyone's gonna gonna win the championship other than him to be honest with you. So uh, yeah, forty three. To be points. incredibly F three, being incredibly F three for something to happen to him for him to lose this now, I think. Exactly that. Exactly that. It's really interesting, isn't it, that he is the driver who uh, is yeah looks like he's going to win the championship when you compare him to someone like Boganovic or Paul Aron who have uh, obviously mm. beaten him. Names you would have uh, thought at the beginning of the season would be right up there, if not winning it, would be very close in it on points and. No one can touch him practically. Hundred percent. I mean, but Boganovic beat Bortoletto. Well, would be Aaron and Bortoletto to to the championship in Freca last season. I don't think uh, coming into the season you would have thought that Bortoletto was the one who was going to win the championship. But you know what? You've got to, you know credit where credit's due. Uh, he's mm-hmm. done the job this year, and um, you know he's uh, he's got a massive massive margin. And uh, yeah, you can't really look beyond him now, can you? Not at all. And Mini in P1, though, as we said, with first pole, he lost the lead at the start to Bedroom, but claimed it back once the pair had cleared the field by five seconds, which is also mad for a three. Bortoletto then was in P2 by the end of it. He snatched it just before the final call on the final lap, which, again, showing this, just don't underestimate this, this driver. And, again, with the gap between the end of F3 and the end of F2, maybe we see him in Abu Dhabi somewhere. Nikita Bedrin in P3 then with his and Jensen Motorsport's first podium of the year, which was just, it's what you want to see in Formula 3. It's that kind of, you have that feel good. You have that that cheekiness of Bortoletto. You've got Mini doing what Mini does. And also, he, so, quick side note on Mini, does he not look like an old man in a young man's body? <laughs> yeah, he does, doesn't he? He really does. I, was, look, I looked at him first a little too long in an interview and I thought, there's something that... Benjamin Button esque about him, and it's not, not his fault, but it just it's, it explains why he does so well. He's got the wisdom from somewhere that is beyond him, but he's managed to manage to use it in this Formula Three check campaign so far. Hundred percent, and what a nice guy, by the way. If you've ever spoken to him uh, outside of the car, what a lovely guy. And uh, yeah, I think uh, for me, I think Gabrielli Mini is probably the driver with the most pace in Formula Three. I want to say that definitely over one lap, and I think for me, he. He'll be in Formula 2 next season. I think he will be a real... Um, yeah, I think I think he could do a great job in Formula 2 next season. Now, I, I think for me, he's one of the most talented drivers on the Formula 3 grid uh, in and amongst an awful lot of talent up and down that grid. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I'd rate him quite highly, Gabriele Mini, um, as uh, one of, if not the standout driver in Formula 3 for me this season, so... Definitely. And then we had Aaron in P4, Goth in P5, Mansell in P6. He's been shaping up nicely as a driver in the last couple of rounds. Yep. Pinto then P6, Edgar P7, Saucy P8, and Beganovic. They're rounding out the, the point scorers there, I think, which was a constant state of fluidity, essentially, throughout the sprint race, because there was just, as we say, there's so much going on in F3 that it's hard to keep track of it all, and you don't know where to look and where to prioritise who we talk about on this because everyone's just doing such a, such a bang-up job. Yeah, 100%. You don't know where to look in Formula 3 d Feature race-wise then, Frederick DNF'd with the supposed puncture but retired, so it must have been something else because I feel like you don't just retire for a puncture. Even F3 when they're not as trained for pit stops, you can still change a tyre. So that was a little curious there. O'Sullivan, though, was absolutely dominant and just claimed P1 from pole. Boganovic then P2 and Colapinto again in the points and on the podium with P3. It was a pretty straightforward race, let's face it. There wasn't too much to write home about, but it uh, it was a tactical race. But it kind of it proved a little bit of drama, but there was not much. There was, it was just the mid-pack where everything was kind of going on, but there was also not much going on, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it was quite a quite a quiet race for Formula Three standards, wasn't it? So uh, I think yeah, we were treated too much in in Budapest previously with with F three, oh. and now it's kind of the expectations too high. Yeah, a hundred percent, exactly. So I it, listen. It was a great drive by Zach O'Sullivan. Absolutely controlled the the race, didn't he? Him and Boganovic were in a, a league of their own. I couldn't believe it when uh, they said that. Um, obviously, it's his fourth win, which is the or well, matches the all time most wins in Formula Three, along with Frederick Vesti, Dennis Hauger. Uh, I, yeah, I couldn't couldn't believe that when 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 they said that stat, which is uh, which is amazing. But I think Zach O'Sullivan is a driver who. Um, you know, maybe has gone under the radar a little bit this season. I think he's done a good job for Prima. I think um, he's, he's he's clearly a very talented driver. You can see that from his junior record of uh, yeah winning GB3, for example. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it'd be really interesting. Again, I think he'll be another driver that jumps up to, to, to Formula 2 next season. I think there'll be a few, you know. I think Mini will be one. I think Zach O'Sullivan will obviously step up. Bortoletto, Paul Laron, Boganovic, I think will step up. Maybe Pepe Marti as well. I think there'll be be a real gaggle of uh, same as last season of Formula Three drivers stepping up to Formula Two, um, and it'd be really interesting to see how they how they get on this season. But um, yeah, Zach O'Sullivan, great drive by him, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how he does for the for the rest of the season. Bad day weekend overall for Montoya, and a bad day for Mini. Just to round things up, then another DNF Montoya. Just very unfortunate there because we know he's capable of more. It's just some bad luck coming his way, and a bit of a. A fall from grace immediately for me, unfortunately, there. But as as we've talked about, there is uh, there's no need to look into that too much. He'll be back, sure enough, very soon, probably in Spa. As 100%. for as for drivers that stood out across both F two and F three for me this weekend, I'll kick things off with F two. You know who I'm going to say, Fraser? It was Jack <laughs> doing Return of the King with pole win and fastest lap. I just need you to agree, and we can move on swiftly. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. Jack doing great drive. Uh, he's back. <laughs> Anyone else stand out for you in F two in particular, or are we just going to settle for for Mister Doing? Uh, I think it's you can't look any further than Jack Doing, can you? So I think Correct for Johnson. me. <laughs> Frederick Vesti's consistency is really shining for another P2 finish and he's doing everything he needs to do to to win the championship. So I think that's impressive. Um, and Dennis Helga controlled the sprint race. But again, as I said earlier, I think he'll be hoping for for more than just sprint race victories. So, uh, but no, Jack Dillon's obviously... It, it's, the, it's a good so. quality in a driver like Helga where you win a sprint race and you're disappointed with it because it means yeah. that you know you're capable of much more and you want that the extra and you've got the motivation for it, which as a team, you're like, yes, we want that and we're going to keep that hopefully. 100% and it's the same with Jack Doohan. Jack Doohan hasn't been happy all season with, with performances and the only, the only time he's happy is when he's been in the feature race. So uh, it's a real it's a real strength in terms of mentality for, for drivers like that, isn't it? So. Formula 3-wise, for me, I was kind of looking down into the mid-pack a little bit further down to see if there was anyone there worth shouting out to. And for me, Luke Browning in the sprint race, P18 to P11, it's something you can't really shake a stick at. It was solid progress and he made some nice moves throughout that race. And Again, it was it's it's only a sprint race. There's less time in theory to make it happen. Although, weirdly, the feature race and the sprint race were the same length this weekend for some reason that I'm not 100 percent sure of. Um, but again, nothing off off Browning there. Nice solid little drive. Yeah, I agree. Luke Browning did a, did a really good job. Um, I, I think he's definitely a, a standout driver, and again, someone who I'm sure is going to stick around in Formula Three next season. Maybe get a big drive and uh, maybe be a championship contender next season. I, I think someone that stood out for me and has stood out for me over the last three rounds is Franco Colapinto. Um, quietly going about his business, quietly consistently, there, yeah, getting getting podiums every single, well, most rounds. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't think the MP car is the best on the grid you know i think it's quite comfortably behind prima and behind the trident for example which uh, makes them the, the you know the, the, it's difficult to get a top six finish if you're behind both of those uh, teams in in formula three but he just consistently pops up with podiums doesn't he and in, in not necessarily the quickest car and um yeah i think he's quietly as, as i said uh, consistently going about his business and, and doing a really good job this season another podium for him in the in the feature race this weekend Essentially doing a little bit like Victor Martins last year does enough to just build that consistency there. And whilst it's not enough for a championship this year, it's exactly what he needs to be doing to set him himself nicely for, for next year on that one if he, if he stays in F3. 100% or maybe he'll step up to, to Formula 2 and my team will take a gamble on him. I don't know, but I'm just looking at the standards now. 93 points. He's only eight points off of second in the championship. 
in a car that is quite considerably slower than the cars that are in front of him. You could say the same about Pepe Marti. I don't think the Campos is, you know, the the maybe the fourth quickest car in in Formula Three, and obviously he's it's up a there. One hundred percent situation there, isn't it? It's it's the driver rather than the car getting the maximum out of it and showing that if I can do this in this car, put me in a Premier or an ART, look what I can then do. 100% exactly that. And, you know, I think both Pepe Marti and Colapinto are, are doing exactly that. So, uh, yeah, fair play to them. My last shout out for more amusement purposes is uh, Christian Madsen in the feature race. He did defend well with a car that wasn't able to do much, to be fair. But also the, the rival for my Alex Brundle quote of the weekend is his team radio, where the team were telling him the, the car ahead, they're quicker in the final corner. And he comes on cool as anything else goes. Perfectly politely, despite the obvious here, I don't mean to be rude, but no shit. It's just like <laughs> very much a racing driver's response there to. I had figured this out for as much for myself, strangely enough. I didn't need you to point that out to me. He's a right character, isn't he, Christian Man? So I love the relationship that him and Pepe Marti have. I think it's absolutely brilliant yeah, in those, in those campus characters. A hundred percent. And uh, yeah, listen, he's, he's doing a really good job in the last couple of rounds. Had a great round in Silverstone. Uh, got that um, that that podium um, for the first time and uh, another really strong weekend in, in, in Budapest. Maybe not quite as strong as what it was in Silverstone. Maybe, you know, dropped through the through the pack a little bit. But, um, you know, still showing that he's, uh, he's he's a really strong driver. He's coming on leaps and bounds this season. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think he uh, yeah could be maybe someone to look out for next season as Formula 3 moves. Uh, yeah, into 2024. Get Nigel to come in and help out because we know he's definitely related, don't we, Fraser? Oh, of course, of course. He's obviously related to Nigel Mansell. You know, that's, uh, uh, yeah, just look at the surname. Only people obviously. on the inside really know that one. Uh, exactly that, exactly that. We'll move on quickly to Flush Watch there, which uh, essentially we just take a look at Sophia Flush, how she's been doing this weekend. It's, it's pretty much banging exactly what it says on the tin. Qualified in P28, and I'd say that even though it's tough qualifying in mixed conditions, I think of all the bits of of her racecraft, qualifying is probably her weak point here because especially when you've got a grid of, of, of 30 cars there, I mean, we know the car that she's in is definitely not the best on the grid, so that doesn't help things a lot there, but I'd say it's it's not quite as bad as Arthur Leclerc's qualifying from Formula 3, but it's it's not to, the two want a million miles away from each other. Yeah, I, so Sophia always seems to she seems to climb in races, doesn't she? As you say, you know, P twenty eight in qualifying, but was it P fifteen in a sprint race and P eighteen in the feature so P, race? P right? seventeen in the sprint race, but she made up seven places in the first four laps, which was just yeah. damn impressive. And then kind of was a little bit there, and we saw Austria as well. What she can do when there's a an opportunity to be taken hold of there, and feature race again, ten places up to P eighteen. Felt like a tricky race there, but solid progress nonetheless. And it's interesting that she, A, most times this season has been beating her teammates. There's been one or two times where it's not happened. And whilst other teams have been mixing and matching drivers a little bit, she's been that consistent driver within her own team and within some of the drivers at the back of the pack. And she's just there like, I don't need to beat these newbies coming in. I just need to run my own race and see what I can do there. And my competition is not with them, it's just with me and I'm going to keep going and, and doing the stuff and it's it's one of these weekends I think where there weren't really many retirements across the board there so it was, or if they did happen she was already past them so it wasn't helping her anyway because she'd already overtaken them yeah, hundred percent. Great race prof to to make her way through the field. You, you, we don't see it very much on 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 camera, if you like. But um, yeah, uh, great race prof to 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 you know fight her way through through the field. And um, yeah, you know if she can, um, you know maybe not sort out her qualifying. That sounds a bit harsh, but if she can, you know, get herself up Fine. a little bit higher up the up the up the up the standings in qualifying, then I think she'll set herself up lovely for for some points in the races. So uh yeah, yeah really it's that fine margin if you could get into like P twenty, P eighteen for qualifying and you do what you do in the race normally then that's points. And that's consistent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think we've got to bear in mind as well. I don't think the PHM is the best car on the grid this season. I think that's fair to say. Um, so uh, I guess limited by that as such. Um, so, yeah, I think overall, you know, she could be really happy with her progress and with her season so far. Uh, and, you know, again, we're looking forward to next season with only two rounds to go. I'd love to see her back in Formula 3 next season. I think it would be uh, brilliant for the sport and brilliant for her as well. I'll say on the podcast what I've said to you privately in terms of 
what PHM and other teams do in terms of promoting drivers up to F2. She's, in my mind, still got two points on the board. So that's two more than a lot of other drivers have got before being promoted to F2. So that's all I'm going to say on that one. <laughs> Maybe she can do yeah. a push mining and just absolutely trance it then when she gets there. <laughs> we will also mention Jamie Chadwick in this as she was in the Indy Next category over in Iowa this weekend, qualified in P13 and finished P10 in the race. So good solid points then with ovals, staying out of trouble and making progress up the grid is pretty much all you can ask for because it's ovals. We don't we don't really want to touch those. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, I'll be honest. I didn't actually watch that race, so I don't, uh, I don't know how she watched, got on. I watched the five minute highlights, and it was just pretty much staying out of trouble and and getting on with things. And that's, okay. again, the crazy it's Indian NXT is very much the cousin for Formula Two and Formula Three. It's got that nice bit of craziness to it. I think there, it's 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 a very good feeder series, and I'm glad that she's over there. So it was and again, she's proving that. I was looking at the championship standings, and it would require some calamity to happen to those ahead of her but she's not a million miles away from being in the top five overall which for a rookie year in a category that she's being challenged by is not a bad thing at all yeah pretty solid and we all know from uh um uh championships in w series how good a driver jamie chadwick is so um yeah no great great for her and as you say as a rookie uh being being that that high up in the standings is, is obviously a really positive thing so uh hopefully she'll continue to to learn to adapt her driving style to to what it's like out in the in the, in the states and uh yeah who knows she might be an indie car in a few years i'd love to see that i'd love to see that too to be honest that would be chef's kiss uh, as for driver and constructor championships for both of these seasons and both these series, more likely, F2 wise, we've got Vesti out in front still with 153 points, or Chair still a hot in his heels with 142. I love how I've missed out the name here for P3, but I know it's Iwasa because Iwasa. it's always Iwasa with 132 points. He's really not far behind, not far behind at all. He could still do this. He uh, could, pray- outside chance. Prima and ART, as we mentioned, in joint kind of first on points, but it's Prima in P1 with uh, Count back in ART and P2. And Dams are also in Formula 2 back in P3 on 171 points there. As you're the guest and you don't get to talk about F3 too much, do you want to have a read of the championship standings for, for the drivers and constructors? Oh, I can do. I can do. So we have uh, Gabriel Bortoletto, top of the standings, with 144 points. 43 points here, clear of Zach O'Sullivan on 101 points. Uh, and finally, rounding out the top three, we have Pepe Marti on 100 points. But that little gaggle between Zach O'Sullivan in P2, all the way down to Gabrielli Mini in P7, separated by 14 points if my maths is correct so a real tight gaggle and i think yeah exactly i think you know it's uh any one of those six drivers could end up p2 at the end of the season if they have a, uh, a good round in either spa or monza so that will be an interesting one to keep an eye out on as for the team standings uh prema are top of the team standings uh on 289 points not that far ahead of Trident, actually. 274 points for Trident, so not too far behind. And again, that's all to play for as we move into the final two rounds of the season. And High Tech are actually the team that round out the top three, 154 points. Uh, but again, quite close between High Tech, Campos and MP Motorsport in uh, yeah third to, to fifth. So again, all to play for as we move into the final couple of rounds of the season. Perfectly done. It's almost like you do this on a regular basis in, in, for another podcast. It's 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 just spooky. But uh, that is all we have time for on this week's episode. Join us again soon. We'll have some more excellent F1 content for you, most likely in the form of feeder series review action from Spa. So do make sure you've liked, subscribed, and got notifications turned on to not miss anything there. In the meantime, though, Frazier, where can the people find you if they're not sick to death of listening to you already? I was going to say, if you're not sick to death of listening to me already, you can find me over at Inside F2. Um, so, yeah, go and check out our, our YouTube page where we review um, every round of the Formula 2 Championship. Also do some driver interviews over there, which is quite cool. Uh, we're also on Twitter at F2 Inside. And we're also on Instagram at Inside Formula 2. So, yeah, go and check us out over there if uh, if you want to hear some more Formula 2 thoughts. It's great stuff should definitely go and do that as for myself you can find me over on is it fast on the curbs the nitro rx podcast paddock's royalty and instagram and as it's a feeder series weekend in spa 
I will be in Casterly instead because F1 Academy is there this weekend and that is how I get to watch it because it's not going to be on TV. So this is what I have to do. And uh, so, yeah, if you're there and you've listened to this, come and say hi. That is very much all we've got time for, though. So thank you very much for listening and we will be back soon with more Undercut Podcast goodness. Thank you.